So I'm to like Beimer. So to share with you a word. Thank you. This is this quote you have here. Thank you. It's from Seder Hadaris. <coughs> Seder Hadaris lived about 400 years ago. My father, Oliver Shalom, told me that he that the Baal Seder Hadaris was a Baal Ruach HaKodesh, the Bechil Helperin. He, uh, besides collating information from all of the Mora, etc., about the very, it's like a list of biographies or, or of, of uh, personalities throughout the Tanakh and throughout the Gemara. But he also brings from the Sifri Kabbalah. And so there's a lot about Gilgulim, identifying who is who's who and what's their previous identity. So here's some fascinating stuff which I never heard until this year. And that's the following. Number one, so let's look at the part, top of the page. Rebakiva Hoyo Gilgul Zimri. Now, have you started speaking? Yes. You can't hear me? Can't hear? I can hear. I can hear fine. Okay. Right. So. Again, so we have here Rebakiva is a Gilgul of Zimri ben Solu, and he was the Nossi of the tribe of Shimon. Now, the tribe of Shimon, they had this kind of the whole story with Zimri when and, and there was a, then there was a whole fight, and it says that there were 24 uh, you, the end of Parshus Bolok, uh, Arbo of Estrim Olaf. There are 24,000 people who, who fell in the in the attack on, on, on the tribe of Shimon. And we've got here a Bakiva. We know the story with a Bakiva. He had 24,000 Talmudim, and they all died in the same in this period. And that's why we've got the mourning during Sphira Shoimer. And they stopped dying on Lag Boimer. And that's the reason why we have one of the reasons for Lag Boimer. That the Meis Tamid of Rebakiva stopped dying. So let's read this again. Zimri Rebakiva is a Gilgul of Zimri ben Solu. Zimri ben Solu is from the tribe of Shimon. Shehorag Bishchem. Now Shimon, as in Shimon, the son of Yaakov, they he and Levi actually made a massacre in Shechem. Now Shenoi Meilu Chof Dalud Aleph. This information is new to me. That the um, the number of people killed in Shechem by that massacre was twenty four thousand people by Sh Shimon and Levi. But they actually were innocent in a sense because they they were innocent because and they had actually. Um, they had had a bris. They had conformed with the request, and they'd had a bris. So now, because they, Shimon, had massacred the people of Shechem to the number of 24,000, therefore, as in a kind of retaliation, the tribe of Shimon was punished with 24,000 people who were killed by that magefa. The Gilgulom, that wasn't finished yet. The Gilgulom Hoyu Chavdalod El of Talmide Rebakiva. And then the Tikkun, so to speak, for the massacre in Shechem, came back a second time with the Talmide Rebakiva, and he gives a reference to Masora Mamoris from, um, that's, name, that's from Renu Chayriki. That's that's so that's one piece of information. Twenty four thousand, twenty four thousand, and that connects um, Rebakiva to Zimri to Shimon. Then we go a little bit further. The next piece I've skipped a little piece there because we're Chesed Avrom. The Gilgul Nefesh Zimri who Rebakiva, who Tikunoi. Rebakiva it came 
as the neshama of Zimri to rectify what Zimri had, where he had gone wrong. The Cosby he is evil. Cosby, who was the shiksa who uh, Zimri was caught with, and she was also killed, she came back in the form of Izevel. And I'm going to skip for a moment the next line. Where do we see, we see that Izevel had an obsession to chase Eliyahu? Why was she obsessed to, 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 to punish Eliyahu? Because Eliyahu is Pinchas. Pinchas had murdered her. And therefore, she was obsessed to take revenge against Eliyahu Zepinchos, Pinchos Eliyahu. Meanwhile, Izevel, so Cosby came back again in the form of Izevel, the wife of, wife of King Achov. And then she came back again. And this time she came back as the wife of Turnus Rufus. And there's a story in Gemara with, in the, of the Zohar Davchov, where Rabbi Akiva, um, he would often have debates with Turnus Rufus. And the Turnus Rufus got very upset that he was always losing the debate. So he came home and he was in a bad mood. And his wife said, what's the problem? So he, so he said that there's this Jewish uh, sage who is always vanquishing me in debates. So she said, do you give me permission to test his integrity? And she dressed herself up as a Zaino, and she went to Rebakiva to try to seduce him to do something immoral with her. Rebakiva obviously wasn't seduced, and when he saw her, he did three things. He cried, he, he spat, he cried, and he laughed. So Mrs. Turnus Rufus says to Rebakiva, what's the meaning of those three reactions? So he says, two I will tell you, one I won't. I spat because you, as any other human for that matter, is born from a tipos rucho, from a, a smelly bit of sperm. So people are proud with their beauty, but after all, what is a human being? It's just coming from a bit of sperm. There's nothing really to be proud of. I cried because of your, your beauty will, will uh, decompose in the dust eventually. You'll die and you'll become decomposed in the dust. So that's why he spat and that's why he cried. And then she says, but why did you laugh? Or why did you smile? He says, I told you, I'm not going to tell the third thing. Years later, she, I don't remember exactly the details why, she, she, she was no longer married to Tornus Rufus. And she was intrigued about Yiddishkeit, and she was Megaya, and she then got married to Rebbe Akiva. So that was why Rebbe Akiva smiled, because he could see in Ruach HaKodesh that she was destined to get married to him. And when she did, she actually brought with a fortune. And so Rebbe Akiva, in his later years, well, he also had a fortune because of his wife, Rachel was the daughter of Kalba Sabua. That's a separate story. But more also, the, she brought a fortune to him. But that's, that wasn't Rebbe Akiva's... Uh, biggest um, excitement. So now, so let's come back. So we got here, Cosby comes back in Izebel, who harasses, who chases uh, Eliyahu Zepinchas, and then comes back in the form of, uh, in the form of uh, the wife of Turnus Rufus, and now meets up with Rebbe Kiva, who is a Gilgul of Zimri, who was her mate in a way, in a sense, in the previous Gilgul, or two, 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 two generations back. Now, here comes another interesting twist. The Zimri Hoya Bendino Koidem Shenos Shimon. We know that Shimon, sorry, we know that Dino had been abducted by Shem. Well known that Osnas, who got married to Yosef HaTzadik, she was born from Shem, and the, the reason why, and although she was brought up in Yaakov's house, but be, and the name Osnas means Loshen Osoin, which can mean accident or can mean rape, whatever. Oines. So she was from that union. But here he's saying that actually Zimri is also somehow from that lineage, from, from Dina before she got married to Shem. In other words, Zimri actually had Shem 
genes in him. So it makes all the more sense how he was, he was in a sense, he was trying to um, settle accounts. And uh, then, we, we, then we, uh, he kind of leads this rebellion as if in the name of the 24,000 people of Shechem who were massacred. So I'm not, doesn't, no one's just suggesting he had that in mind consciously. But sub, subconsciously, he was leading this rebellion and 24,000 people fell in kind of retribution for the massacre in Shechem. Then, what does it finish off? But Chavdal the Elif, there's 24,000 which were killed in Shechem, they were killed by Shimon, they, were, they, they came back again as a Tamid Rebbe Akiva, and they were punished because they didn't respect one another. Um, similar, they should have remembered the sin of Shittim, which, they, and which had, they hadn't been cleansed from. So what we're having here, a fascinating journey of Rebbe Akiva, going back to, uh, again, going back to Zimri, and going back to Shimon in a sense, and then we've got um, his wife going back to Izel, going back to Cosby, and the 24,000 kind of has, ha happens three times over, so to speak. Finally, the, these, the, there's a bit, it's a bit repetitious, and I'll explain to you why, because the Esed Hadoris is drawing from various sources. So the first one was from uh, one source from uh, um, Sarma Morris, and this is from another source from Chesed Lavram. So there's, he brings them kind of uh, more or less what they what they say in full. And then the next comment is unrelated to this whole journey, and that is that Rabbi Akiva, his name Akiva relates to the word okay, which means a heel. Now, when the Yaakov was born, it says that he was seized, he seized onto the heel of Esau. The Yodoy Oichezes Akiv Esau. His his hand was holding on to the heel of Esau. So in a sense, now we know that Rebbe Kiva was originally, his, his, his origins were from Gerim. So he had non-Jewish, he had Esau origins. So Yaakov, as is born, is pulling something away from the heel of Esau. And that's Rebbe Kiva, who is re, kind of redeemed from Esau and brought over into, into Kedusha. And then the next piece he says about the Vobs that Rebbe Kiva we see has later, he's um, very much into Darshning Vobs and he explains that's got to do with this story. Okay, so that's, I think, just, just some fascinating stuff uh, as a Hakadama. Let's go on to the next thing on our list. And that is that someone asked me, uh, he had seen a, some kind of venture, but he had this famous song, did Nefesh. And it said there, Now we say, So he asked me, was it, was it just posh a mistake? So I was, my curiosity was piqued. And so here you have, this what I have over here, I believe is from a uh, Sfardi Siddur called Beis, Beis Oyved or Beis Manucha. Um, so the Sfardi Nusach, actually has Vahoysa Loch Shivchas Oilom. And this is from a Chabad Siddur. The lower one is from a Chabad Siddur. Vahoysa Loch Shivchas Oilom. Now the... Is the, it without a misprint? No, 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 no. It's not a misprint. Let's, let's, let's explain. So this goes back to the one who composed this song. Is It's attributed to the Bharedim. That is Rebelez Azkari or, Zak or Azakri, who was a, a contemporary of the Arizal, he lived in Sfas at the time. And it, this is attributed to him, although there's those who say originally it had five stanzas and the extra stanza had was a Dalad and therefore it had the name Yehuda. Then later it was the Dalad stanza was taken away and it's left with the Rosh Tabas of Yudke Vavke. And that's the way it is in most uh, prints. But then the, in the first print of the Charedim, which I didn't manage to look inside, although I have it on the on the on the uh, uh, Oitzar, I couldn't find it there. The first print it said shifchas oilam, and so the printer didn't understand what does it mean shifchas oilam. It should be a a, 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 a a she shall become an internal maid servant. So he changed it to simchas oilam, and then a later print it was then corrected. It shows shifchas oilam. So here we have. That was talking about the love of the Neshama to Hashem. Rafon Allah healed the Neshama, 
and show it your, your glory, your beauty, and it will the neshama will be bound to you, will be committed to you. So that's the that seems to be the original form. However, the Ashkenazi form has has evolved to that the simchas oilam that the neshama by having this joy of getting close to the abrishta and have this tremendous uh, this uh, eternal joy. So they're, they're, they're both. They're both nuschoyes. What what's I mean. the pshat if you say shivchas? That the neshama will be committed, as if we ask to eved neem or eved poshut, eternally committed. That's that's the uh, that's the pshat. Okay, let's go on. So this is not so much halacha. Let's get to halacha. So having a discussion the previous weeks about the croutons, and I mentioned last week that the definition of the brach on the croutons will be, uh, if they're deep fried, is mezainus, because even though it retains the, what we call, torisa de nama, it still has the constitution of bread, but because, because it's been cut down to smaller than a kazais, and now it's in a, uh, and, it, and it's been cooked, so then it goes down to mezainus. So deep fried croutons are mezainus. So someone asked me, what about matzah bride? What's the, what's the, what's the brocha on matzah bride? So let's read here. This is again from the Alter Rebbe Seder Birchas Anenin. And what you have at the bottom is from Reb Avrom Alashvili. He's a brilliant uh, Talmud Chochem and lives in Lud and has published numerous for him. But one of his masterpieces has been the uh, presentation of Seder Birchas Anenin. And to the back of the volume, you have a tavlo, a table, of a list of all foods and brachas, uh, the appropriate brachas. So I'm going to first read, actually, his table. Lechem pira lepirurim, chusim mikazais, v'govales and bemaskim, v'tignom, v'leholacht mehem to our lechem. If you took bread, broke it into small pieces, less than a kazais, mixed them in a liquid, you fried them, but it hasn't lost the appearance of bread. So he says, It's a sophic, but it's mezonus or mahamotzi, and therefore he's saying you should, you should only eat it during a meal. You can't make mezonus on it, you can't make hamotzi on it because of a sophic. So now let's learn the halacha properly. So sif tesva. lechem If you've got crumbs of bread, which are less than a kazais, They've been sucked together with honey, with milk, with soup. If they become mushy, they don't no longer have this kind of, I'm, I'm suggesting, the stringy, in a fibrous uh, structure of which bread has, like with pores and all that. It's become mushy, not that form. Then the brocha is going to become mezoinus. Because it doesn't, it, 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 it was less than a kazais. So this we have, that's the basis of, let's say, chalakugel, which we all know from kids, that we didn't used to throw out bread, chas So it was left over chala, so then it was recycled into chalakugel, and that was mezainus. By the way, uh, in, in, in Brunois, um, Baruch, you probably remember the Shol Noyach, so... Um, so in your times, he was, he was an old man, he was 70. In my times, an old man, he was 90. And um, so Bishol Noyach lived with his son, who was 70, and found out and he needed to have the zonus. So how did these two old men, and there was, they, his wife had died years ago. So what, how did he make mazonas? So they took the French bread, soaked it overnight, and the next morning it became mazonas. And that was their mazonas, far and down. Go tell it to the Bochum today. Okay, you know, to myself too. Okay. But if the bread did not lose its consistency through the cooking, it's still got the structure of bread. So even if you've cooked it and was smaller than the kazais, but if it didn't lose the appearance of bread, if you have it for a meal, that's going to be uh, uh, going to become possibly hamotzi. But the, the mik is the last line. When it comes to frying, so there's a question which is mentioned a couple of times in this chapter, 
we've got cooking and we've got baking. Cooking is with lots of liquid and softening the material. Baking is usually drying out the material. Um, that's, I don't know what baking does. Frying is with a little bit of liquid. Well, the food does sometimes become a bit more stiff through frying, but what is the definition of frying? Is it, is it considered bishul or, so if it's deep frying, deep frying is for sure, is like bishul, and therefore, that's why I said croutons, which are deep fried, becomes, uh, become mazonis. But if it's just like matzo braai, you just got, uh, you break the matzo into small pieces, uh, and then you fry it with a little bit of liquid, a little bit of oil, uh, even though it's a millimeter or two, but it's not, it's not a lot, it's not deep fried. So then he says, So we're going, we're going to be stuck when it comes to frying, is it called cooking? And therefore it's made the matzo braai into mazonis. Is it called, is it similar to baking? And therefore the matzo braai still remains hamotzi. And that's why Rabbi Alashvili is telling us, because he says you should be machmer on both sides, so matzo braai remains sophic. And therefore you'd only have matzo braai during the meal. Okay. Dan, what do you mean by during a meal? Does that mean if you only ate that as your main uh, course, you would wash over it? That, that, that even then it's a shayla because, because pos, if you say it's called mevushol, then it's, it's gone down to mezonis. And that's what he said before. If it actually lost its, what he said over here, even if you ate a lot of it, even if you have a suda, it still remains mezonis. When you mush the chal, it becomes mezonis gomel, even if you have a suda. When it doesn't lose its toalechem, then he's saying we're not sure whether it becomes Mazonas Gomor or becomes, or where, in other words, Mazonas Gomor is not upgradable to Hamoitzi. Like pasta can't be become Hamoitzi. Whereas if it's somewhere in between, then it can be upgraded. And what he's saying here, we're not sure whether when it's not been really mushed and still left its toy alechem whether it's going to be, can become a zonus or it's going to remain a Muhammad. It remains a suffix. So there we go. So the matzah brai means, means it remains, um, so what are you saying? Bechol inyan. Bechol inyan, whether it, if you have a shiur kvei suda or even less, either way is saying. But if it's tigun, again, sorry. Yeah, it's a bit tigun I can't make my mind up whether this has become a mazonus or is it still a Okay, let's move on. So someone asked me this week, a Shaila, um, <clears throat> that his optometrist has told him that he can see some kind of development and it might develop into a cataract, but a way to discourage that developing, wearing sunglasses will help him um, not have to have a cataract uh, operation um, in the next few years. So now he's asking about wearing sunglasses on Shabbos in the street. So the, 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 we've got, on, we'd actually, we learned, okay, this came up because we're learning Simon Shi and Aleph on Shabbos afternoon. And we've got things which are garments, which we're allowed to wear on Shabbos, obviously, in the street. We are allowed to wear tachshitim, ornaments, jewelry. We're also allowed to wear other accessories, which are making our our ability to function better. That seems to be the, the, the definition of glasses. Glasses enables you to, to function better. It's not that you're carrying the glasses because we need them somewhere else. They are managing, they're enabling you to manage your life better as you are. That seems to be the basis of, of uh, wearing, uh, uh, the permission to wear glasses on Shabbos. I know that my uncle, David Raskin, Shalom, for years, he didn't wear glasses on Shabbos in the street. And then the Rebbe once in a sicha, kind of in a comment in passing, said, explain why, and that, that's why you're allowed to wear glasses in the street on Shabbos. So from then on, he uh, changed, he started wearing his glasses. But I, I don't know whether he did a Hatarash Nadarim or not. I never asked him. Okay, let's read now what it says here in Shmir Shabbos Gilchasa. Mishkevei Shemesh Rigilim. Regular sunglasses. 
which was not prescription ones, which are just to protect from the sun rays. One shouldn't wear them in the street. Included are if you're wearing the, the sunglasses on top of regular glasses. So these are, can be two forms. They can be either those clip-ons, or you can have a, like a bigger pair of glasses which sit on top of the regular glasses. And the meanwhile is saying that they, they shouldn't be worn on Shabbos. Now, but then we're not finished yet. And now here we have um, the notes in the Shmir Shabbos Gilchasa that they should, the hard Tzvi, hard Tzvi is that's the, the Pesach Frank, uh, who was the Robert of Yishalayim, um, about 50, 60 years, 60 years ago. I heard that Rabbi Shimon would say that many of the contemporary poskim, he's, he's, he's okay, you know, he's on, he can, I can say, on par. But he, he had great respect for the Hartsvi. So after he did, the Hartsvi talks about regular glasses being, he calls a malbush. And it says that, uh, he says that sunglasses are not called an irregular malbush. Then he says, That's for medical reasons, if you don't have a proper Rishusarabim, that would be okay. The person tends to get some inflammation in his eyes if he doesn't wear those sunglasses. Yes, mokim lohokil. Im einoi moitziim l'shusarabim gemura. If it's not a proper l'shusarabim, then one can be lenient with wearing um, sunglasses to protect uh, from inflammation, and should be careful not to take them off in uh, when when it comes sh in shade. Obviously, that is going to be carrying a shabbos. So there seems to be where there is a l'shusarabim gemura. There seems to be a, a, a worry about wearing um, sunglasses. Whereas, I mean, if it's, if it's a long-term condition, the only thing I can suggest is to get photogray lenses for your regular glasses. And you're, those you're allowed to wear, and the photogray lenses are part of the, of the, uh, the glasses. There's no shy of carrying. And it's not a worry of coloring when you put, expose it to it changes color because it's, it's not going to... Uh, it's, it's not going to, it's not, doesn't remain. So that's, that, that would be, uh, if that's, a, if it's, an, it's a long term condition, that would be a, a, a solution. Okay. Right. Another topic totally. <clears throat> I got a question from a boy. I don't, don't know who, who he is, but he sent me this question that we have this idea of, of uh, the Alter Rebbe talks about a, a blanket having four corners, so it's a question of tzitzis. So the Alter Rebbe recommends to cut off the corner of the, of the blanket. Now, the only ones I've seen who do this is Bochrim and Yeshiva, and usually it's the Yeshiva blankets. Now, the reason why I haven't seen anywhere else is because it's only in the Yeshiva that I go around the, in the dormitory, I would see that. I wouldn't see other people's <laughs> their blankets in their bedrooms, but um, not so well known. Um, if you are going to be machmir, don't do it to do a quilt full of, full of feathers, unless you want to do hafotza. So now, this, this is the Alter Rebbe's Loshen. This is in the Siddur. Ha michse shekoirin koldre. The koldre is that was brought up with that word. A blanket is, is a shemechase miskasin boy kesheyoshin b'yoyim. A blanket which is worn when you sleep during the day, afim ikra yimuchid lelaylo, even though it's designated for night. Yes, last is boy keren echod agula. You should make a, a, a corner, a round corner, le potre mitzitzis, to make it exempt from mitzitzis. No, so why are people not doing this? So look, let's read those words very carefully. The Alter Rebbe is saying, he's not talking about a regular blanket. If you have a seder of sleeping by day, and you have this blanket with which you use for sleeping by day, then it becomes a beged yoim, and therefore it's chay v'tzitzis. But if you're not used to sleeping by day, the Alter Rebbe is not talking about your blanket. He's talking about a blanket which you'll sometimes use by day. 
Now, if you doubting this pshat, so then here I've got here the Sefer El Yorabo. It quotes here the Mogan of Rome. El Yorabo is a commentary on the Levush. of El Shapira. It's got El Yorabo, El Yazuta too, a short commentary, a long commentary. So it's in the it's built, it's in the uh, Sefer Halavush, the new edition has got there on the page. So he writes like this. Morgan of Rome says that if you have a, a woolen, if you have a woolen um, sheet, you should make a round corner. A very interesting Kiddush. In this time of the year, the sun rises, let's say, five in the morning. And so if you, if you wake up at six, wake up at seven, wake up at eight, you've been wearing it for three hours in the day. That doesn't make it a beged yoim. The fact that there's an overflow from the night into the day doesn't make your pajamas a beged yoim. It's still a beged lilo. Only such a garment which your dafka wear by night. Then that becomes a beged, a beged yoim. Sorry, that, your dafka wear by day. That makes it a beged yoim. That explains... Um, that explains why most of our blankets. When do when do you go when do you go to sleep during the day? Unless you you know people get a bit older, they sometimes have to rest during the day. They rest with a blanket, without a blanket. But that that seems to be a strong basis why people are worried because it's only talking about a a blanket used for day day a dress during the day. I'm going to finish off. This piece. <clears throat> I want to read something serious, and then I can tell you, I'll tell you a, a funny thing. And that is, this is a, a letter of the Frederick Rebbe, and he's at the time he is he was born to Fish Mem, so he's thirty six, and he's he's with his father in Rostov, and he says, "Nifle, I cannot restrain myself to see the pure God fearingness of my father." When my father has a haircut with a special machine, sometimes I do the haircut for him. I noticed that the cloth, the sheet which he wears, not to get dirtied with his, the hair falling off when he has a haircut, before he puts on the sheet, he cuts off one of the corners of the sheet and makes it round. And it's obvious the intention. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be a garment of four corners. And it'd be chayvetitzis. Now I understand when we came to the hotel, he wouldn't use the covers, the, the blankets over there, even if they were pure white and very clean. But he was, he was worried not to wear a, a, a four corner garment without tzitzis. Fascinating. So it looks like, so, so, oh, so now someone's asking, what about Shabbos? People have a rest. Shabbos, yeah, it's a mitzvah, Shabbos is in your Shinab Shabbos, Tainu, Rosh Tevas Shabbos. Here's a fascinating halacha. It says in Simon Yud Gimel, you come to Shul on Shabbos and you don't have a talus. There's only one talus available and it's got one tzitzah missing. So one of the tzitzah is apostle. That's the only talus available. So it says in Shulchan Aruch, you're allowed to wear that talus. And the reason is because, listen carefully, Mitzvah tzitzis, this is from the Modche and the Menachas. Mitzvah tzitzis is not like shatnas. Shatnas, the moment you put on shatnas, you violated shatnas. Mitzvah tzitzis is not the moment you put it on, but it's the moment you put it on, you have to put in tzitzis. You are kind of, when you put on a bag at the four corners, you've incurred a chiyuv to, to, to add tzitzis. Shabbat, you're honest. Shabbat, you can't put on the tzitzis. So on that basis, if you are stuck on Shabbos and the only talus available is one without tzitzis or the apostle of tzitzis, you're allowed to put it on. So that and explains, therefore, the fact that you have a, a, a shluf on Shabbos, um, uh, it, it takes off, it's not a problem. Someone's asking a beggar to protect clothing is not, is not chayev. And certainly the hotel, the blank in the hotel is not your beggar, bichlal is not chayev but tzitzis. But you know what the frumkaiten of the Rebbe Rashab were? You know, we've gone through this before. He had this tremendous frumkaiten. Perhaps he said, perhaps the schirus is considered like a balabatish kaiten, therefore the blanket becomes yours. Whatever. Okay. 
Um, you ask someone's asking, does sewing in a corner work or do you need to cut it? No, so, sewing um, is not going to be enough. You're going to actually have to cut off a corner. But if it's a, if it's a quilt, please think twice before you do it. Before you start cutting off corners, yeah. Perhaps sew it and then then cut the corner before you, before you lose all those. Uh, well, what I want to just share share with you is that I heard from Major Katznelberg that when he uh, came out of Russia, so he um, vi visited his brother in Cleveland, and it was about nine o'clock in the evening, and um, and some visitors came. And he just came out of Russia. It was a very big novelty at the time. So he so they they he asked him to come down from his room. So he he had been he had come to America and they told him in America England whatever and they showed him that people wear at night they wear pajamas, so there were these guests who had come to the house. So Ramesha came down in the evening wear he was wearing his pajamas, and they found it very funny why he came down in his pajamas. He said, "But you told me this is what in this part of the world in the evening you wear pajamas." So, so he he, he found it very funny. So okay. Right, so someone's asking a question. If you see someone wearing postal scissors on Shabbos in the street, that's like a, another question, which is a, a big shiloh. Okay, let's um, go on to another question about the bris. Very um, real question. A shliach, somewhere in Europe, has a, they know a, a, a woman who's Israeli, and she's married to a, a, a non Jew who's was one of these Russians who came to Israel and never was there was never Megayer, so he's Al uh, Goyla Mahadrin. And uh, they had a baby. And it's been five years since they've uh, since the baby is the baby now five years old. They never had a bris. Finally, now they've agreed that they've agreed to give the child a bris. Well, they're going to go to a goish, they're going to go to a surgeon, a goish surgeon. Then they asked the shliach, they asked him, would you be so kind to come along to the, to the operator, well, to the operation, to this uh, procedure, and you'll be there. So he's asking, is there, is there any value in him going there? And there's one side of it is, is there any value? And there may even be a downside. Let's say someone's making a bris a goy, with a goish a goish um, surgeon. So then that's going to be uh, uh, poor people will learn that that's okay. So this is his dilemma. So he asked me. So here we have, first of all, we have here a quote to the top of the page, top left of the page. We have a quote from the Shukhan Aruch, Simon Reis Samachay, that it says a goy, even if he is circumcised, he shouldn't do a bris. He shouldn't be the moil. But in mole, but if the goy did circumcise, then you don't have to do it again. In other words, even if there was a possibility of, of, of cutting some more, you wouldn't do it again. Then the yesh oimim, the Ramos says about hatofas dam bris, which people are familiar with. So now, before I started looking into this, in this what's the problem if a goy does a bris? Why is it possible? Is it because he doesn't do it lishma? So sometimes we have the idea of Yisroel Oymud al Gabov. If a goy is doing something, but the Eid is there and saying we're doing this for, for this and this purpose, that may, may, may benefit. So I was right and I was wrong. So here we have this is the Gemara of Zora. Ta starts off if a, if a um, if a goy does a bris, he's throwing a goy in the yomel. It says, don't have a goy do a bris because he may do something wrong. He may, he may, may harm the child. Then Chachom say that a Chachomim would be okay if if there are others there to see that everything is being done uh, correct, it would be okay, but not in private. And then, so then there's a discussion, but then the Gemara says that later, that the, chachom, the various chachom say no. If a goy does a bris, it's possible. Because we learn how, how, only the one who has been chayiv 
can do a bris. How we see that a goy does a bris is possible. The ato is brisi tishmei. It has to be dafke yid. Dafke yid has to do the bris. So here we have. Um, so that's why. Lechatchila for sure. The Shulchan Aruch says you, you don't give a goy to do a bris. There are those tanoim who say that it would be valid, and possibly that's the reason why it's valid bria. But then, as I was looking for this, I found a fascinating chiddush, which I, um, this is from Rabbi Yaakov Emden. Now, Rabbi Yaakov Emden, he published a siddur, as I've mentioned numerous times. He also put together a sefer called Migdal Oiz, Migdal Oiz, and that talks about the mitzvah of, of uh, Milo and a few other things, Pidyon Aben, I think. So now, this is from the Migdal Oiz of the Rabbi Yaakov Emden, who was... Yaakov Emdin was a contemporary of the Baal Shem Tov. Akum, a goy should not um, do a, be circumcising at all. Now, even gamkein, even if if you can find a Jewish moil, so you have to bring him from elsewhere. Even if it means a delay of the mitzvah, pass the time. If you are anticipating that a Jewish moil will come, then you have to delay the bris until you get a Jewish moil. But if you are in a situation that you don't expect ever a Jewish moil to come your way, Odif, it's better to use a goy. Fascinating hapsak. If you are in a situation where you it can be people in some deserted places, no moil, and there's no 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 travel, etc. Uh, no, no, not expecting any moil to come their way. So Biakiv Emden says, have a go do the, the, the circumcision. Now, coming back to this. So therefore, if the go is now looking at this situation, the child hasn't had a bris for five years. Now they finally agreed only with a goish surgeon. So there is there is something to be gained. If he is going to be there. It's going to be Omen Dal Gabo. If he's if he's can persuade the surgeon to allow him to use the knife to do the actual chituch or part of the chituch, it will be done Ali Day Israel. So there is, I feel there is uh, what to be gained by him being there. Um, and then the repercussions, other people will say, aha, he did had a goy to do the bris. So he could say that he could tell people that I the, the surgeon allowed to do him allowed him to do something. And I, I can't tell you what he allowed me to do. In this way, they don't. It's, it becomes you know, private information. But he, he was there, and it would. He was, it made it as kosher as possible. That's that's my feeling in this in the given situation. After I looked into this, I just saw on one of the um, websites that there is um, in Hong Kong at the moment. They have a very serious problem that they uh, children have been born, boys have been born, and because of lockdown, etc., and quarantine. There's no, um, in the foreseeable future, near future, I don't see um, any moil in coming, but that, I don't think that would fall into the category of Rebakiv Emden because there, you know, lockdown's not going to be forever. So there's going to be a possibility of moil coming. So therefore, they're going to have to delay until such time. Whereas um, uh, in this case, it's like it was so uh, open ended that I think there's more reason to be made for, at any rate, to recognize. Let's, um, well, then we have here a question. A, a fellow, uh, he's actually a shliach, and he lent, he had a building fund, and the money was just sitting there, so he lent it to another shliach. And then, the, now he's ready to go ahead with his building, and the, the borrower has been defaulting and not paying. Uh, it was a six-month loan, it's been a couple of years, and it's really, so he's now, the, the, the lender is asking me, He's very, uh, very chassidish guy, and he says, it says in the Torah, you shouldn't oppress your borrower. And I'm worried, what happens if I have, un, um, uh, you know, I've, I've perhaps over, overestimated the ability of my borrower? Perhaps he can't pay. By forcing him to pay, I'm doing something very wrong by, by forcing him. So what should I do about that? So I dug up this from the Alter Rebbe's Shukhanaruch. It talks about the, the issue of demanding. So that's the Sif base. If you oppress the borrower who's poor 
and you know that he doesn't have with what to repay, neither money nor, nor um, m m portable uh, items, then if you know that he hasn't, you still oppress him, then you're over Lysia Kenosha. Now, there has been published a, a, an edition of the Alter Rebbe's Chosh Mishpat with a commentary by Rabbi Yaakov Ver Sternschlitter, a Talmud of Rav Vosner. So he's, it's called, he's called Imre Yaakov. So this is his commentary. Um, so he says here, Mash Madafke Beyoidea, Avel Im Humestrupik, Mutaloli Tvoya. If you're not sure, then you are allowed to demand the Torah did it loy ostroboze. You're not expected to know the other person's private accounts. And therefore, if you're going to say you can't because he might not have the money, then you're, you're going to be saying that people can't demand their debts to be repaid. And therefore, he says in the third line, he says, the issue is only if you know for a fact that the borrower doesn't have any money, then it's wrong to oppress. But if he, if he may have the money, so then you are allowed to oppress. And uh, I hope he will take that and um, push for his thing and he should be able to get the money back a fellow can borrow from another another source, and um, he should be able to go go ahead with his building plan, as uh, you know, what the money was raised. Finally, this is a question which I arrived today, which um, I find a very big chiddush actually. And German from uh, he's a shliach in Germany, he said, I, "I I bought a box of Israeli figs, and I want to give them as a gift to a goy. Is that okay?" So, are you allowed to? We're, if we want to eat those figs or dates, whatever, so we have to take trumas and maestros. Can you give that we are going to assume that the stuff, the food coming out of that stroll, unless it has a hersher, hasn't been maestered? Are you allowed to give non maestered food um, to a goy? Tevel. The word for that is tevel. It's not truma, not maestered. Are you allowed to give it to a goy to eat? And so I looked around and the halacha and say you're not allowed to. And the source is from this Mishnah. This is a mission in the end of Peir, uh, Perik Aleph of Peir, where it says there's a concept called miruach. That's a certain kind of smoothing the surface of the pile, which is like finishing that, that, that pile, and that's when it's chai v'maisa. So it says, Until the moment of miruach, which is, in other words, it's premature for maisa. Then you can feed to an animal. But once you've done miruach, once you've actually finished the the uh, harvest and, and, and the pile and you've smoothed it, so then you wouldn't have to be b'machel behema, and the same thing you wouldn't be a machel anochri. So, it, in other words, what we're seeing here is that the consumption of food without trumas and mice is being done, even though it's not for a barchiuva, it still remains also to do it. And therefore, this becomes now actually though a very big surprise for me because then. If you were a, a Jewish grocer and you sell Israeli, a green grocer, and you have Israeli um, product, produce, you wouldn't be allowed to sell it to a Goisha customer because you're going to be releasing stuff um, without, with, with, which is high of a mice and it's not going to be mice, which seems to be a big kiddish for me, but be that as it may. Meanwhile, I wish you all a failure like Boimer, Kedai Hurub Shimon, Lismer Chalov, and we should be get out of this Dachak. Out of this pandemic and out of this gollus, and go to the Gula and meet us with Shlemo, the Simchas Oilam Al Rosh. Amen. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, oh,